I'm going to be talking about one very specific corridor. I think as you saw from that talk, there are multiple corridors and you have to be very creative when it comes to the posterior fossa. It, it definitely has uh, its own challenges. Um, I'm going to talk about specifically the endoscopic endonasal approach, same disclosures, uh, again, uh, particularly relevant for this. And uh, we talked before about the anterior module of approaches, and here we're going to be talking about lower down in the rostrocaudal access. <laughs> the uh, endoscopic endonasal approach to the clivus is really very direct, and per perhaps it's uh, the most direct approach. It can virtually all be done with a zero degree endoscope. And these are what I see as some of the advantages and limitations, and I'll discuss those a little more in a moment. Uh, the endoscopic and nasal transclival approach is a midline, uh, it's a midline structure, and this is a midline approach that ends up being extremely direct. The clivus traditionally was divided into thirds. This is uh, uh, from Shaker's book, uh, and this is essentially based on which approaches are needed to access different areas of the clivus. So the upper third would be an orbitozygomatic, the middle third, some sort of transpetrosal, anterior, posterior, or combined, and then the lower third below uh, the jugular foramen through a far lateral. Um, we can make similar divisions from an anterior or an endonasal approach, but they're really just extensions of each other with various uh, uh, different aspects that are done uh, to access those areas. So I think a little bit easier to, uh, to move between the different areas of the clivus. Um, when we talk about uh, uh, the upper third of the clivus, uh, sorry, we'll, we'll get to the upper third of the clivus in a moment, but it, it truly is a, a midline approach and so any tumor that we're accessing that way is really uh, very direct. Um, this is what we see once we remove the clivus. We see this venous plexus. I think it's important to understand the relationship of that venous plexus. You can see many tumors invade it uh, between the periosteal and the meningeal layers here. You, if you haven't had it invaded, then you'll have to deal with this plexus, which can be as ferocious, ferocious as the cavernous sinus. But chordomas and meningiomas both can invade this interdural space. Uh, and then beyond that, of course, we see the vertebral basilar junction, and this is uh, as well as the trunk of the basilar, and I'll talk more about accessing that. But uh, the mid clivus is really a very uh, uh, directly accessed through an endonasal approach. And here's a typical case of a young woman with a clival chordoma, and uh, uh, the endonasal approach has become, I think, a workhorse very widely accepted for clival chordoma. Here we're drilling below the tumor, and one of the critical uh, pieces for a chordoma is to not treat this like a pituitary tumor where we reach around a corner and kind of scrape some soft tumor out, but rather we resect all the bone and all the dura completely surrounding the tumor, because if we don't, then you these tumors can recur, and radicality of resection for malignancy such as this is critical. So uh, a wide bony removal below it is very important. Uh, here we see a dissection above it using a pituitary transposition, which I'll discuss a little more in depth in a moment. Uh, here we're removing the posterior clinoid. We found in chordomas that uh, uh, for especially upper uh, chordomas, about 80% of the time, the posterior clinoids actually were invaded with tumor. So if you don't remove the posterior clinoid, you're actually leaving tumor behind. So wide bony removal, both inferiorly and superiorly. And then once we've removed all that bone, here we see, you can see the inferior hypophyseal artery there preserved. Although you can, uh, you can sacrifice the inferior hypophyseals on both sides uh, without consequence to the patient's pituitary function. So now that we've done a wide bony resection, we're carefully delivering this tumor. And you'll see that the majority of this tumor is interdural. So while it may invade the inner layer and push it in, oftentimes it is preserved like a diaphragma. Uh, the Fiesta imaging can be very uh, helpful to help determine whether or not this is preserved or not, but here we're dissecting it free. I'm using a, a cartouche stimulating dissector, the same as I would use during a vestibular schwannoma surgery uh, through a retromastoid approach to be able to make sure that I stimulate the sixth nerve. Once we've dissected this free, you can see the clear invasion of the meningeal layer. This is a young woman. I want a radical resection again, so I want to get a complete resection of all involved dura. Here you can see doing that resection, I'll, uh, I'm stimulating the sixth nerve. I want to get uh, even wider resection of the dura. You can see some tumor residual here along the edges of the dura. So we'll go ahead and do a resection of all of that. And I see a little tumor there in the, again, in that interdural space, that's where it loves to grow. Durello's canal is an interdural structure. And so here's our final removal of all the periosteal, all the meningeal dura, right up to Durello's canal. 
uh, for a truly radical resection of the tumor. Here you see the post-op uh, showing a complete resection. I'll talk more about uh, how our reconstruction has evolved over time. Up into 2015, we'd uh, operate on about 150 uh, chordomas, getting a gross total resection about 60% of the time. Uh, and I'll talk, and we have improved over time uh, with the learning curve with that. And, and the gross total resection rate in primary tumors is significantly higher than in recurrent tumors. Um, for chordoma, the goal of surgery should always be the most radical resection possible. Uh, and in many of these, you still need to use an open approach. Uh, more and more, the, the most common one would be a, some sort of extreme or far lateral to gain access to a portion that is lateral to the lower cranial nerves. We have improved over time, though, our understanding of how to extend more laterally. Um, and the truth is that um, uh, by accessing these in the midline, we're able to maintain a lower rate of cranial neuropathy. These are midline tumors pushing uh, the nerves more laterally. So we have a very low rate of cranial nerve um, deterioration, really probably lower than what's reported in the literature for open approaches. And that's purely, I think, a function of corridor selection. Uh, there are some new things that we can use to avoid vascular injury. Here's one that's very tough to tell uh, once we open, where is the, the basilar itself? And so this is endocyan green. We're just sort of seeing a haze of tumor capsule. And as soon as I use an endocyan green endoscope here, I can see very clearly where the vasculature is and I can see very clearly the cut. And other pre previously I would have had to uh, maybe take a guess, use image guidance, but here I can very clearly see where the vasculature is. Of course, we get recurrence, and uh, like with meningiomas, we learned from our recurrences. Um, again, uh, gross total resection was the most significant predictor of non-recurrence. Only 30% of the time did we see recurrence after gross total resection. And the, uh, the thing that we learned was that probably most recurrences were inferior lateral. I'm pretty happy with this initial post-op, but uh, next to the carotid artery, obviously we didn't get as wide a resection. So here we see a resection, uh, a recurrence inferior and lateral. So the anatomic limitations, we really struggle inferior and laterally um, and the lateral neuroframina are uh, our limitation. But we did get better at this over time. These were the factors that affected gross total resection. So very large tumors, especially with lateral extension. But over time, we improved that. So years of experience made a difference in our ability to get a gross total resection. This is where we published our initial learning curve. And you can see while overall, we only had about 60% gross total resection. We've now gotten where about 90% of the time we're able to get that. Again, that golden rule of not crossing nerves is critical. And where we learned most was in the lower third of the clivus. And typically we thought about the clivus as being bounded by the paraclival carotid arteries. But the truth is at the lower third of the clivus, you're below frame and serum. So we have a much wider area to access in this uh, region. And so this is what I jokingly coined uh, as the far medial approach. So here we can see this chordoma going all the way out to the jugular foramen. But the truth is that this far medial approach gets us the exact same access as a far lateral in that we can access the jugular tubercle. So here you see the jugular tubercle being involved uh, and we can remove this right up to the inferior petrosal sinus. So by dissecting frame and lacerum right here, I can remove tumor and bone right up to the inferior petrosal sinus. I can very gently pack this off. I don't wanna to get too aggressive with my surgifoam because this of course could extend and embolize to the jugular foramen. The inferior petrosal sinus also is a great landmark of our limitation because remember just that is the most medial aspect of the jugular foramen and just lateral to that is the pars nervosa. So here we see jugular tubercle, here we see condyle, and in between them is the hypoglossal canal. So now our only limitation is not the carotid artery, but rather the hypoglossal canals. And on both sides, we've drilled out the hypoglossal canal with the jugular tubercles and uh, medial occipital condyle above them and able to get a much more radical removal. Here's an example of a little bit of a unique uh, pica aneurysm, so presenting with subarachnoid hemorrhage. But what you'll see here is this pica takeoff is extremely medial. So uh, the aneurysm itself, as you can see on this AP uh, uh, angio view, is really quite medial. So it's coming off right about here. You can see where the jugular foramen is. So you know that your window here between 7, 8, and 9, 10, uh, to get any distal control is going to be virtually zero. And so getting distal control on this would be extraordinarily difficult. So instead we used a far medial approach. 
Again, this is only because this was a medial, uh, a more medial and anterior uh, pica aneurysm. I would not typically do this for a pica aneurysm. Uh, here we're doing a, a little inverted rhinopharyngeal flap, which is a, a nice adjunct. We found that by preserving this, all of this tissue between uh, the nasopharynx and the oropharynx, pretty much eliminated the risk of uh, leak through the mouth, which was a problem initially when we were resecting all that tissue. So here I'm drilling down, down to the frame and magnum after I've dissected free all of this uh, basopharyngeal fascia. So we're below the sphenoid here, drilling down to the lower third of the clivus. And now here you can see the cella up top. There's our vidian nerve. I'm gonna drill right back to the periclival carotid. Not that I need to particularly expose it, but I want to at least know exactly where it is. I can disconnect the eustachian tube attachment. I'm not, uh, I'm not transecting the eustachian tube. I'm just disconnecting it. And then this allows me to drill immediately next to and below foramen lacerum. So here's foramen lacerum right here, paraclival carotid artery. And I can drill out this jugular tubercle. This is that far medial exposure. Again, the opposite, the complementary approach to a far lateral exposure. By drilling this out, this gives me that proximal control on the vertebral artery. So I need more lateral access to get proximal control from a far lateral. I need more medial access to get vent to get distal control. Now we're opening the dura very widely. You can see the subarachnoid hemorrhage. And then I can see the vertebral artery giving rise to this pica aneurysm. You can see all of the blood. Now I have good proximal control on the vert. I have great uh, distal control on the same vert. And the beauty of this is that actually I'm preserving flow into the basilar. So I can trap this aneurysm, very ugly looking aneurysm, multi-lobe. You can see why they, they couldn't uh, um, embolize this or coil it. The only difficulty here is I had a hard time seeing the takeoff of the pica. So I, I placed the clip across the aneurysm and it, and it did rupture at this point, very thin walled kind of ugly aneurysm. So I uh, placed a, a, proximal, a proximal clip, able to get a little better control. Again, I could have trapped this, but I, I wanted to try just replacing it. Eventually able to get a little better control. And then I did an icy green run and I saw I'd left a little blister here. And in addition, when I looked down underneath with the pica, I saw no filling of the pica. You can see a great view of the lower cranial nerves. There's no way to even see this aneurysm without dissecting those laterally. So you would have been quite sure probably to give some sort of lower cranial neuropathy. So here I'm probably foolishly trying to reposition this without having trapping it. So instead I put that clip back on and I trap the vert, the basilar's still filling, only the pica is not filling. And then I can better clip that blister and I can leave open the pica. A little separate clip on that blister. And now I do another ICG. I can see my pica filling. I can Doppler the pica. And then this is just testing the pica again by uh, clipping proximally to make sure that there's backfill across it. So there's our final view. And a, a multilayer reconstruction to cover the clips. And here's our intraoperative gram and post-op showing a, um, a, a treatment of this, although she did get a post-operative leak, which required uh, related to her hydrocephalus from a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, we can go even lower to the cervical medullary junction. Um, uh, here's a case of a cervical medullary meningioma. Uh, very much sits between the, two, uh, between the two vertebral arteries. So I can gain access to it this way. Kind of. Uh, in the interest of time, skip along. Here's that inverted RP flap, uh, rhinopharyngeal flap, uh, drilling out again the jugular foramen and the hypoglossal canal, a nice wide exposure around the foramen magnum, and then we can dissect free the tumor, take it all the way down to the tectorial membrane. There we see one vertebral artery. You saw the other vertebral artery. And here we can see the anterior spinal artery extending downward. So again, direct access to the ventral surface of the tumor gives us a Simpson grade one resection of a skull-based tumor without any disruption of the lower cranial nerves. But of course, this is much farther along in our learning curve to do this kind of a case. And no, uh, no cranial cervical instability because we haven't impacted uh, the transverse ligament, uh, only perhaps the apical ligament. How low can we get uh, endonasally? Uh, 
Well, we first reported the odontoid in 2005 and, and since then have never used a transoral approach for a degenerative or uh, arthritic odontoid since then. And you can generally predict how low you can get by drawing a line between the bony nasal bridge and the hard palate posteriorly and extending it into the depth. Usually we end up about a centimeter above this, both because of soft tissue, which this doesn't predict, but also because we often don't need to get quite that low. The uh, indications really are the same as they are for a transoral approach. Um, and you have uh, uh, many cases that we've done for different indications. And this is just showing the dissection. Again, we use this inverted uh, RP flap now to flap down to separate the oral pharynx and the nasopharynx. And this is a case uh, we just did recently. Uh, and you can see a very calcified panis. You might say, well, I can just fixate this from behind, but this patient already had a decompression elsewhere. Unfortunately, they did not do fixation. And so he was, uh, he was um, progressing really rather rapidly to quadriparesis. And so we decided to decompress him from uh, the front as well. And I'll kind of skip this through this in the interest of time. But here you can see we've drilled out the C1. I try not to drill out all of C1. I try to leave the anterior ring intact uh, because that leaves a little more stability because remember most of these patients only need a C1-2 fixation. Most panis is C1-2 disease. It's not, uh, the condyle itself is not involved. Here I'm removing the soft tissue, the joint capsule essentially around C2, the dens. Then I can identify the odontoid, drill it down, and once I've removed that, now I can deal with all this panis. Here we can actually see a bit of the transverse ligament after I've removed that. Once I open the transverse ligament, resect the transverse ligament, I have almost nothing but all of this thick calcified panis. You'll find that the ligaments become much more difficult to distinguish. They become, uh, they essentially turn into this panis. They become a combination of, of calcified uh, and, and granular tissue that we can just peel out here. But you do have to be able to recognize that's the transverse ligament there being resected. And then once we get up to the tectorial membrane, this is not dura. You do not have to expose dura. You just have to expose tectorial membrane, which is what this is. And then here we're elevating up uh, the rhinopharyngeal flap at the end. I hold it in place and place some tissue to help hold that into place. And here's our uh, immediate post-op showing a beautiful decompression. This has very clear advantage over a transoral approach. These patients can be fed immediately and we can avoid any of the issues that we have such as velopalatal insufficiency. And when we study this, it simply is not an issue. So again, our, uh, all of these approaches have limitations and there are very clear <coughs> anatomic limitations uh, in the posterior fossa. In this case, <coughs> the inferior one is down to the tip of the dens. You might ask, well, we're doing all these low and lateral resections. Certainly we're causing instability if you're drilling out the condyle. Well, uh, this is a, a study done uh, with a combination between the BNI uh, with uh, Curtis Dickman, who did the original far lateral study, as well as Danny Prevedello. And they found that about, uh, there was a, an inflection point biomechanically around a 75% condyle resection. This seemed uh, like a lot to me, but we looked at our clinical series to see the same, and clivus certainly doesn't matter. You can resect that without any instability. So when we looked at this, we found that, sure enough, we had the same inflection point. When we resected more than 75% of the clivus, of the, rather, 75% of the condyle, we ended up causing instability. So the truth is that probably between 50 and 75% of the condyle, we might be able to observe some of these patients. Less than 50% were essentially always able to avoid a fixation as long as you don't violate again the transverse ligament. So I often observe patients between 50 and 75%, but if they have uh, uh, pain out of, uh, out of uh, context from what you think they should, then probably they need a fixation. Uh, what about tumors like this that extend up to the upper clivus like this petroclival meningioma? Is the, is the cella a limitation to our access? Well, the upper third of the clivus typically would require an orbitozygomatic approach to access the posterior clinoid. And when we look at this from an endonasal perspective, the obvious thing in the way is the pituitary gland. This was first described as an intradural uh, pituitary transposition that you see on the left here. 
Uh, but really, I think the safest way to both preserve the gland and also safely fully dissect the posterior clinoid is to do this intradural or transcavernous uh, pituitary transposition that Dr. Fernandez Miranda first described after we started doing it. So here you can see uh, uh, just by opening the cavernous sinus, we leave the remainder of the venous drainage in the intradural sinuses around the pituitary. And here's uh, uh, the drawing from the article or rather the dissection from the article that just shows opening the cavernous sinus and dissecting out the posterior clinoid. So a case like this that goes up behind the cella, we can very clearly access that. So here I'm coagulating and then eventually we'll cut that. And then we have access to the posterior clinoid. There's coagulating, cutting the, uh, uh, the inferior apophyseal artery. And then I'll usually uh, use a kerosin to split the dorsum in two. You have to be careful. You can see the posterior gland does not have the same kind of dural sac around it that the anterior gland does. So there's a higher risk of DI in this setting. Uh, here I'm peeling out both posterior clinoids at the same time. I would not recommend that. I usually split this in two and do them separately. But here you can see the kind of uh, a pure, uh, kind of access we can get uh, to get a pretty nice resection of this petroclival meningioma. This can be used certainly for a, a basilar aneurysm as well. Uh, very rarely here you can see a very broad necked anterior posterior, but also low lying basilar aneurysm. So this is one by using a pituitary transposition, a very radical clivectomy. And here you can see I'm exposing and splitting the dorsum cellae in two. And then I'll, I'll go interdural. So here I've opened the cavernous sinus on the right side using a little hook feather blade, dissecting out the posterior clinoid. There you see opening that cavernous sinus a little more widely. I have to expose a little bit of the carotid and be comfortable doing that. But here we're able to dissect out the posterior clinoid first on one side and then on the other. You can see both cavernous sinuses open, carefully dissecting free the dorsum. There's the spike of bone, which is part of the uh, uh, ligamentous attachment to the posterior clinoid, the interclinoidal ligament. You have to make sure we dissect that free to not cause any damage. I'm opening, I've resected the outer or the, uh, the, the periosteal layer of dura, and then finally opening the inner layer of dura, and I have beautiful access to this aneurysm. I have access to uh, the basilar trunk. I can trap the aneurysm if I need to. My initial clip uh, slipped off because uh, because of uh, uh, too much turgor in this, in this broad neck aneurysm. So I had to remove that clip. And then here you can see I've got proximal control to decrease the turgor in the aneurysm. And then I did what's called a shank clipping with a bayoneted clip to grasp the front of this very broad neck anterior posterior aneurysm, and then placed a fenestrated clip across that, around that to get the distal or the deep part and you'll see us looking around the corner here with the endoscope to check to make sure I haven't gotten any of the perforators on the deep side. Absolutely, from a lateral approach, you'd have direct view of those perforators, but by bringing the endoscope around the side, I can visualize to make sure none of those perforators are hit. Here, I have to back it off a little bit because I picked up a perforator and replace it, and here's my final view. Here's our post-op showing a complete treatment of that aneurysm. Uh, this can also be used sometimes for very large meningiomas, such as. Hey, Paul, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> the way that the back of the clip sticks into the sphenoid in terms of your reconstruction, <laughs> how do you work around that? I'm sure you've, you've fixed yeah, that. Issue. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely a problem. Um, uh, and we had a lot of leaks with these at first. This, you know, these are sticking out. So, what I do now is I put a piece of fascia sort of folded over it. Um, so it can heal to the dura on either side. And then we place fat on top of that. I think it's here. So I put collagen. You have to put fat in there. This, uh, and then we put fat around that and then the flap. So yeah. I, I quit cutting that hole like I did here. And I just put the fascia folded over top of it, covering a greater area all the way from the cella down and then the fat. When we didn't do that at first, we've actually had two of these erode through that uh, Dr. Schneiderman had to put an inferior or lateral nasal wall flap on. And then one that actually eroded through again and the woman has refused any other treatment. And it's been about three years with just the distal end or proximal end of this clip that's visible in her sinus, but knock on wood so far, no complication <laughs> from that. Although it makes us very nervous, but she simply refuses to let us do anything else. Wow.
it's it's cool. been nice a job. learning curve. No um, this is a uh, 53 year old, very robust guy who basically lost the ability to walk almost from this very large petroclival meningioma. Uh, he does have some hydrocephalus, a very high functioning um, uh, guy formerly in the military. And you can see this requires clearly a pituitary transposition. I won't belabor the exposure more, but uh, we did this in two stages. So did the initial debulking without doing, uh, uh, did the exposure initial debulking without um, doing any extra capsular dissection because the extra capsular dissection is where it really gets tricky and that can be later in the day. So we finished this first stage around two or three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, certainly much more civilized, and then came back later and did the pituitary transposition and did the remainder of the dissection. Here we can see the left sixth nerve and there's the right sixth nerve. These are always challenging to dissect out the sixth nerves because uh, they don't have a predictable pattern ever in a petrochival meningioma. Even, uh, even you can try to guess what it is and sometimes you might be right, but uh, you are usually guessing. Here we can see the PCA extending upward in the third nerve, working with an angled endoscope. And here's our final view. Oh, there's our uh, final view looking at the basilar and the nasal septal flap after uh, a multiple uh, layer reconstruction. There's a higher risk of CSF leak as was hinted at, and this is the same for open and endonasal approaches. Here's a very obese young man who kept leaking in fearly, and I talked about that RP flap that now makes a big difference. But here we didn't have much uh, uh, tissue down low and very obese guy. So we use this V-lock technique. This is just a barbed suture that you'll probably find on your plastic surgeon's cart that doesn't require tying a knot. So here's, we threw a knot, which you can do. So we can tie knots, but it is time consuming. Uh, and, and it does take some practice to be able to do this effectively. So here's me tying a knot with a, a vicral suture first. And then here's using that barbed V-lock and all you do is throw, throw, the, uh, throw the stitch and then you put it through this eyelet and there are little barbs on the stitch. And so as soon as you throw two or three more loops, those barbs start catching on, uh, on themselves and you don't have to tie another knot. So I simply throw this through. I run it along the whole length of the lower uh, basopharyngeal fascia here. And this is locking. You see the little barbs there. It locks with each stitch that I throw. And so then when I'm done, I just throw a little, maybe a little figure eight to lock it all together. And then I cut it. And I don't have to tie a knot there. So this is a much more efficient way to throw a tying knot. And that's what finally fixed this leak for this guy. Uh, lumbar drains for posterior fossa are critical. This was the other group in our randomized controlled trial. Significant difference in postoperative CSF leak rate for more than centimeter uh, size uh, defects. Uh, so lumbar drain, I think level one evidence that this makes a difference for these defects. One other thing we saw is that we would occasionally get these encephaloceles where the pons would herniate into this large bony and dural defect. One of the most significant things was if we didn't use a fat graft to bolster against that, these patients would get this encephaloceal. And so now we've started using multilayer reconstruction where we include fat graft. And I've not seen a single case, knock on wood, of this encephaloceal since we started doing this multilayer reconstruction. So collagen, you'll see a very large piece of fascia, which covers all the way from the tuberculum, all the way down to the basopharyngeal fascia. That's our fascia put in place, a piece of fat then to build up just to the level of the carotids and then covering the fat and the fascia with nasal septal flap. If the fat is exposed, it can get infected. So very important to make sure you have a small fat bolster and a large nasal septal flap. So this is our reconstruction now. We found this to be very effective. And again, we're down to about a seven eight percent CSF leak rate across the board using these multilayer reconstructions. There are still remain poor options for carotid control. You have a tumor like this where the, both the parapharyngeal and the petrous carotid are involved. And here we had to do a cut down in the neck which I had done fortunately in, in advance in this child because of that parapharyngeal carotid involvement. And I ended up though injuring the petrous carotid. And so we had to sacrifice this once we confirmed that he would tolerate through neurophysiology. His immediate post-op angio shows a persistent trigeminal artery 
and, uh, and, to, and a, a robust circle of Willis. So we did get lucky, um, but I couldn't have done much else other than pack that off and hope for an endovascular salvage. So these are different uh, risks and our advantages and limitations of the approach. It does have very clear anatomic uh, limitations uh, as well as vascular control limitations and CSF leak rate requires a fair amount of experience. Um, these are the different uh, training levels uh, for learning curve that, that we've sort of developed and, and uh, followed ourselves over time. Some of the things I've shown today um, really I think uh, are appropriately questioned as to whether or not they should be done. Uh, we never tried certainly any of those until at least 10 years of doing this type of surgery. So this, um, you know, we're very high volume center doing a fair amount of this. So I don't uh, necessarily propose that these should be standard of care for some of these types of things. This is showing the validation of those training levels. If you look at the purple, which is level five and the green level four, you can see duration of surgery and blood loss going up dramatically, length of stay after surgery, and also, I'm sorry, uh, um, complications also went up dramatically uh, in the same uh, way. I think this has become a standard of care for midline tumors such as chordoma, especially when they're extradural. Uh, intradural has a, a greater significant learning curve. And as soon as you're uh, going after vascular pathologies, I think that this requires a, a much higher level of experience. Again, invite everyone to join our Skull Based Congress uh, free website. Uh, and uh, I want to thank again, uh, Charlie, and actually all, all the rest of our co-faculty for what I think was a, a fantastic session. And I, I learned a tremendous amount uh, watching as I always do.